Author John Kuiper Liberty presents Gospel Theology, God's Good News for Everything, published by Westbow Press, Bloomington, Indiana, 2021, used with permission. Part 3. Outward Gospel Theology Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. John 20:21. 20, Chapter 27. Gospel-Centered Missional Living But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Acts 1.8 June 6, 1944 was one of the most important days in the history of the world. It is known as D-Day, the peak moment of World War II. The Allies, represented mainly by the United States, Great Britain, France, and Canada, set out on a massive mission to invade the Nazi-occupied European continent by way of Normandy, France. These troops were on an extraordinarily important mission to stop the spread of genocide, civil government oppression, and a worldview against God and all that is true, good, and beautiful. We ought to honor the people who participated in this endeavor. God's work, through their sacrifice and bravery, is one of the reasons why we can do things like worship Christ in public without any direct threat of losing our lives. But did you know that the Church of Jesus Christ is on an even greater mission than what happened on D-Day? I'm not downplaying the mission of the soldiers. I am elevating the mission of the Church to its proper place. It might not seem quite as life or death, because we cannot always see what is going on with our physical eyes, but it is even more than life and death. It is eternal life and eternal death for billions. It is about the redemption of all of God's creation. This mission that God has given us is not optional or secondary. It is what we are to be about in our short lives. Our Missional Identity Our key text for this chapter is in a book called Acts, which is sometimes called Acts of the Holy Spirit. The human author was a medical doctor named Luke, the same one who wrote the Gospel of Luke. The book of Acts picks up right after Jesus' resurrection from the dead. Jesus stayed with his apostles, his initial chosen messengers, for 40 days after his resurrection and taught them about the kingdom of God, Acts 1.3. Before he ascended into heaven, those with him asked about the timing of when the kingdom of God would be finally consummated, Acts 1.6. Jesus responded by telling them not to be focused on the timing, Acts 1.7. Instead, he said, You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth, Acts 1.8. Jesus is reminding the disciples of their identity as those who have a mission, what I call their missional identity. A witness is someone who sees and hears something and then testifies about it. Jesus' words about these disciples being witnesses do not only apply to that small group, since the rest of the New Testament makes it obvious that it applies to all of us. For one example, 1 Peter 2.9, written to ordinary Christians like us, says, But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Proclaiming the excellencies of Christ is witnessing, and this text clearly says that this is what we are to be about as those who are God's possession. We are all to be people living on mission, missionaries, where we are. There is certainly a difference between local missions and cross-cultural missions to unreached people groups, Romans 15.20, but that does not negate the fact that all Christians are missionaries in one sense. We have to start thinking of ourselves this way. It is who we are in Christ. We will see later what these witnesses testify about, but for now know that their mission is to testify in their immediate vicinity, Jerusalem, their greater region, Judea and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. For us, by way of application, Jerusalem is equivalent to our neighbors in our neighborhoods, the cashiers at local retail stores, those on our city sports teams, etc. Judea and Samaria are equivalent to our greater metropolitan and geographic regions, like co-workers, others we see as we are out and about at cultural events and as we take day trips and closer vacations. The end of the earth is obvious. We are to get involved with supporting cross-cultural missionaries financially and in prayer, or maybe even by going ourselves. 
I say Jesus is reminding them of their missional identity because he already told them about their task before this passage. For example, Jesus said in John 20, 21, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. When Jesus was praying to the Father in John 17, 18, he said, As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. Or in the passage that has been nicknamed the Great Commission, Jesus said, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. Matthew 28, 19. Jesus confirmed this is a core aspect of our identity as Christians. You will be my witnesses, Acts 1.8. Not, you may or may not be my witnesses if you have some extra time. No, it is going to happen. And it is going to happen because God himself, the Holy Spirit, will empower them and empower us. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, Acts 1.8. They do not have to, and we do not have to, do this on our own. We have someone at our back empowering us. The empowering of the Spirit is essential because our mission is not a natural mission. We cannot bring spiritually dead people to life. We, by our nature, are dead in sin and enslaved to it, totally dependent on God's grace, Ephesians 2.1. The one empowering us knows what he is doing. He is kind of an expert since he is God. We are not alone on this mission. You have someone way more powerful than the U.S. military behind you. Relax and trust God. He is for you in his cause. You also have the rest of the church on your side. The you in our text is actually plural. Y'all will be my witnesses. You are not Jack Bauer, Ethan Hunt, or James Bond. The mission is a community mission. We should certainly take advantage of opportunities to speak the gospel if we are by ourselves. But as often as possible, we should be involving the Christian community in our evangelism. Tim Chester and Steve Timmis help us here. Ideally, evangelism is not something to be undertaken in isolation. Of course, if opportunity presents itself, the gospel word should be spoken clearly and sensitively in conscious dependence on the Holy Spirit whenever, wherever, and to whomever. But evangelism is best done out of the context of a gospel community whose corporate life demonstrates the reality of the word that gave her life. Churches should regularly have non-Christians spend time with their community, and not only on Sundays, but for things like game nights, going to baseball games, the mall, grocery shopping, or working out. We want to be including those who are not Christians while loving them in all ways and speaking the gospel to them as we have opportunity. Christians, do not assume that people who come in the doors of a worship service or come to a community group meeting already know Jesus. Get to know each person individually, love him or her, and listen and learn without making sweeping assumptions. After all, being on mission means one of our goals is to have people of all different backgrounds around us so we can introduce them to Christ. Our Missional Message We established above that being missionaries is a part of our identity as Christians. But what exactly do we testify to as missionaries? We testify to both the person and work of Jesus. Jesus said, you will be my witnesses, Acts 1.8, not just witnesses in general. This is confirmed in the rest of Acts and the rest of the New Testament. Christians are witnesses of Christ's work, witnesses of individual salvation, and witnesses of Christ's kingdom. Witnesses of Christ's work. First, these disciples, and us by implication, are witnesses to the gospel story culminating in the person and work of Jesus Christ. Over and over in the New Testament, we see these disciples talking about the reality of God's holiness and what it means for us who are sinners. The wages of sin is death, Romans 6.23. Those who have hard hearts against God are storing up wrath for themselves on the day of wrath, Romans 2.5. And then the apostles wrote about the sinlessness of Jesus. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth, 1 Peter 2, 22. And then over and over again, we read about the cross and the death of Christ. Jesus was crucified and killed, Acts 2, 23. The author of life was killed, Acts 3, 15. Jesus was crucified, Acts 4, 10. And the interpretation of Jesus' death is also given, that Jesus died for our sins as a substitute, 1 Corinthians 15, 3, counting as righteous those who trust in him alone, Romans 4, 5 through 6. 
And then we hear about the resurrection of Christ to defeat Satan, sin, and death, ushering in the new creation, Matthew 27, 52-53. This Jesus God raised up, Acts 2, 32. We also read about the ascension of Christ, seated at the right hand of the Father to rule and to reign. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified, Acts 2, 36. So the disciples are witnessing to the gospel story of Christ and his past gospel work. Witnesses of individual salvation. Second, the disciples were witnesses to the applications of Jesus' work to individuals. In Acts 16.31, a jail guard asks these disciples, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. They told everyone that belief or trust in Christ alone is what is required for salvation. The Apostle Paul said, For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. Ephesians 2, 8-9 Grace is God's favor to us who deserve His wrath. Paul said his mission was to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. Acts 20:24. 20, Being witnesses means the speech of these disciples was drenched in the grace of God. They appealed to others to be reconciled to God, 2 Corinthians 5.20, and spoke of the new status the elect have as children of God, John 1.12. Witnesses of Christ's kingdom. Third, they were, and we are to be, witnesses of the kingdom of God, which is also called the kingdom of Christ, Ephesians 5.5. 5. This refers to the gospel story from the zoomed out perspective. John Frame rightly defines the kingdom of God as God's sovereign power, his sovereign authority, and his coming into history to defeat Satan and bring about salvation with all its consequences. And this kingdom is good news. But when they believed Philip as he preached good news about the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women, Acts 8.12. God created all things good. When Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, God pronounced a series of curses, Genesis 3, 14 through 19. Sin impacted all things, and the ugly effects of sin spread. False worship, workaholism, abuse of civil government authority, abuse of parental authority, marriage problems, workplace problems, addictions to video games, pornography, and material things, etc. Then Jesus came, went to the cross, rose from the dead, defeated Satan, sin, and death and reversed the curse. He rose up to sit at the right hand of God the Father, begin to put all of his enemies under his feet, and bring redemption, beauty, and hope, 1 Corinthians 15, 25. We live in what theologians call the age of the already not yet of the kingdom of God. It is already in the sense that Jesus is ruling now as king, 1 Corinthians 15, 25, and has inaugurated the new creation, the new heavens and new earth. Matthew 27, 52-53. But it is not yet in the sense that although Christ defeated Satan, sin, and death, Colossians 2, 13-15, the enemy is not yet finally defeated, 1 Corinthians 15, 25, and the effects of the fall have not yet been fully wiped out, Romans 8, 19-23. Christ's rule encompasses all of reality. It is not purely immaterial, and it is not restricted to the church. It is both immaterial and material, impacting the whole cosmos, including this physical world. John Frame rightly says, As individuals bow the knee to Christ, they discover that worshiping Jesus must lead to action, bringing Jesus' teachings to bear on everything. So the kingdom brings individuals to Christ and also brings those individuals to exalt him in every area of life. It is both individual and social change, until God consummates the kingdom at the return of Jesus to judge the living and the dead. Because of this, we are also the witness to the reality of the fact that Jesus Christ is King, and we testify to the fact that nothing is outside of His Lordship. Art, education, entertainment, politics, home decor, organization, comedy, fashion, finances, business, all of it belongs to Christ and should be brought in alignment with his kingdom, which is spreading throughout the whole earth. Matthew 13, 31 through 33. 
Willem J. Uwenil summarizes, It is unthinkable that the kingdom of God, as some would have it, encompasses only a few domains of life, your private life, your family, and your church. If this were true, it would mean that our schools, our companies, our associations must be viewed as part of the kingdom of Satan because there are no other kingdoms. The kingdom of God is being manifested in all domains of life. This comes to light when officials in these domains, parents, elders, bishops, teachers, professors, employers, administrators, magistrates, and so on, wield their authority in the concrete, explicit recognition that they themselves stand under the authority and commandments of Christ the Lord. Our Missional Methods The aim is love. The missionary identity and message are clear, but what about the methods? How exactly are we to go about being missionaries? The first thing to note is that love must drive our missionary living love for God and His glory. We want God to get the glory He deserves. God gets glory when people are saved by His grace. As grace extends to more and more people, it may increase thanksgiving to the glory of God. 2 Corinthians 4.15 Jesus said loving God is the greatest commandment. So love for God has to drive our missionary living. This love for God is closely related to love for lost people, which is also an essential component of gospel-centered missional living. The Apostle Paul said, The aim of our charge is love, 1 Timothy 1.5. He also said, And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing, 1 Corinthians 13.2. Reaching out and sharing the gospel with others is not just about completing a task, or checking something off the list. It has to be driven by love. Do I really care about what is best for my neighbor next door, or my coworker at the office, or the fellow mom at the park, or my classmate in school or my homeschool co-op? Do I care what is good for them, both in this age and on into eternity? If we do not care about others, our evangelism will be cold and dry. We will be overly pushy, we will cut off relationships with people if they fail to respond in the way we think they should so we can move on to the next project. Or maybe we will never even speak about Jesus to others because we could not care less about what happens to our neighbors. It is true care for God and His glory and care for the good of others that needs to be at the foundation of missional living. If you are reading this and you are not a Christian, I imagine it is strange for you to read all of this talk about evangelism and missional living. Let me make it very clear. Christians do not, or at least should not, think we are better than you, not even close. It is not bigoted, prideful, or mean to kindly tell others the truth. We are just beggars trying to tell everyone where to find bread, where to find the deepest and longest lasting happiness. It is not mean for one person to tell another they are about to walk off a cliff, is it? It is loving. Although you may not agree with us right now, I hope you see the tone and heart of Christians and that we really care about you. Practically loving non-Christian friends. What does it look like to love our non-Christian friends? First, we love by joyful association, by being friends with those who do not know Christ. We love by having actual relationships with them. Being holy does not mean that we run away physically from non-Christians. It means that we seek to refrain from sin as we live, work, and play in the midst of our unbelieving friends. Jesus, the perfectly holy one, was known as a friend of sinners, Matthew eleven nineteen. We are not Jesus, of course. We are the sinners that he has befriended, John fifteen fifteen. But Jesus also said that he was sending us into the world as he was sent into the world, John seventeen eighteen. Physically being around non-Christians does not make us sinful. We can be influenced negatively if we are weak in certain areas, but why do we not have stronger confidence in the Spirit of God that we will influence others more than we are influenced by them? Vern Poitras rightly says, We are not made unclean or unholy by physical proximity to non-Christians because the Holy Spirit dwells in us, makes us holy, and fills us with the power of Christ's indestructible resurrection life of holiness. When we serve Christ faithfully, 
We spread our holy behavior and holy thinking in the midst of the world rather than being overcome by the world. The Apostle Paul agrees, since he said, I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people, not at all meaning the sexually immoral of this world, or the greedy and swindlers, or idolaters, since then you would need to go out of the world. 1 Corinthians 5, 9-10 Paul says that we are to associate with non-Christians. Jesus and Paul both moved toward those who were not Christians. Paul shared his life with the Thessalonian Christians when they were unbelievers. So, being affectionately desirous of you, we were ready to share with you not only the gospel of God but also our own selves because you had become very dear to us. 1 Thessalonians 2.8 We share ourselves with unbelievers. Practically, this means exclusive Christian clubs should not be the norm. Coffee shops, gyms, or sports leagues should not only contain Christians. Loving non-Christians means we move toward them and build friendships with our neighbors, co-workers, and fellow participants in sports leagues or hiking groups. Although we should not feel pressure to talk explicitly about Jesus the whole time, we should never hide or be ashamed of who we really are. Since Christ is Lord over everything, Christians will always be able to share how Jesus influences their thoughts, feelings, and actions on any topic under the sun. Second, we love non-Christians with our words. If we want to truly love people and give them the opportunity to be reconciled into a joyful relationship with God through Jesus Christ, we have to love them by actually speaking the gospel of the grace of God. Romans 10.17 says, Faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. This does not mean that we are obligated to get out bullhorns or noise amplifiers and visit the local marketplace and yell out the gospel to people walking into the grocery store or the mall. I am well aware of the open-air preaching that was done in the Bible in church history. I am not saying that anything is wrong with open-air preaching by any means. However, in 21st century American culture, open-air preaching can sometimes actually hinder people from hearing the gospel message. Previous cultures throughout history did not have TV, internet, or radio. The normal means to communicate messages was to stand elevated in public and proclaim what you had to say. Once again, I am by no means saying that open-air preaching is always wrong. I am saying it certainly is not mandated in every culture, and in many contexts it may be an unwise way to go about sharing the gospel. So, how do we love people with our words? Because it is completely true that faith comes from hearing. The answer? We seek to practice winsome evangelism. This means we consider context and we seek to use tasteful words in our communication. The Apostle Paul said, Walk in wisdom toward outsiders, making the best use of the time. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. Colossians 4, 5-6 one commentary says this metaphor suggests speaking in an interesting, stimulating, and wise way. This entails picking your words tactfully and lovingly. There is urgency, making the best use of the time, because the message is urgent. But we are not to shove the message down people's throats, because we trust that God is the ultimate one who saves, and we know he wants us to present the gospel in a wise manner. Some well-meaning Christians try to pit building friendships in evangelism against speaking the gospel, but the Bible does not do this. It is a both-and, not an either-or. We do not have to share the full gospel with everyone the first time we see them. There are appropriate and wise contexts to share the gospel. We are to speak words that fit the occasion, Ephesians 4.29. Should you share the gospel with your boss at every one-on-one -on -one status meeting? Of course not. That would not be glorifying to God. He wants you to work your job effectively for his glory in an honorable manner. God can sometimes use our conduct to soften the hearts of non-Christians and prepare them to give the gospel word a fair hearing. The Apostle Peter describes this concept. Likewise, wives, be subject to your own husbands, so that even if some do not obey the word, they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives when they see your respectful and pure conduct, 1 Peter 3, 1-2. through 2. 
This does not mean that people can become Christians by only witnessing respectful and pure conduct without ever hearing the gospel message. In the context of what Peter is saying, he assumes that the husband already knows the gospel word. He is discussing the important element of the Lord using the respectful and winsome conduct of Christians to adorn the gospel message. Furthermore, the Apostle Peter also said, In your hearts honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you, yet do it with gentleness and respect. 1 Peter 3.15 this verse mentions people asking us about the hope we have within us. That presupposes some kind of a relationship. People know something about us and have witnessed the hope that is in us. And this verse also presupposes that we are not always sharing the full gospel every time we see someone, since it says they ask. And how do we share? With gentleness and respect, 1 Peter 3.15. Not with pride and arrogance, boastfully and smugly trying to dominate others. You have most likely seen formal debates including smug and arrogant Christians or online videos with titles about Christians destroying others or tasteless memes that are completely disrespectful, exactly the opposite of what 1 Peter 3.15 calls us to do. Those attitudes do not adorn the beautiful gospel message. Charles Haddon Spurgeon, the 19th century Christ-exalting preacher, said, Try to avoid debating with people. State your opinion and let them state theirs. If you see that a stick is crooked and you want people to see how crooked it is, lay a straight rod down beside it. That will be quite enough. But if you are drawn into controversy, use very hard arguments and very soft words. Frequently you cannot convince a man by tugging at his reason, but you can persuade him by winning his affections. We are to love unbelievers by speaking the gospel, but we must seek to do it in a winsome, humble, honorable, kind, and appropriate manner. The gospel message may offend unbelievers, Luke 6, 22-23, but we should seek to avoid giving unnecessary offense unrelated to the message, Romans 12, 17. We must recognize that the only reason why we are Christians is because of the grace of God. We are no better than others. Jack Miller says, A friend summed up the issue like this, When I first became a Christian, I was a poor beggar telling other poor beggars where to find bread. Gradually, though, I became an ex-beggar telling poor beggars to find bread. When our witnessing sinks to this level, we seek not to win others by our welcoming love, but to protect ourselves from any deep involvement in their lives. The truth is that in our heart of hearts, we all long to be ex-beggars, self-sufficient, capable human beings, straightening out other people from above. But grace does not work that way. It falls on the fallen, the needy, the broken, and the guilty. A daily awareness that we must never stray from Calvary ourselves is the most important element in a God-honoring evangelism. Third, we love unbelievers with our deeds. We do not only love with our words. We love the whole person. We actually care about people in their current lives in this age, in addition to what will happen to them on into eternity. Loving them means that we are to do good to them. So then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, and especially to those who are of the household of faith. Galatians 6.10 Let us do good to everyone. Jesus told us to love our neighbor, and when a religious leader of his day asked him who his neighbor was, Jesus told the famous parable of the Good Samaritan, Luke 10, 25-37. In that parable, religious hypocrites did not want to help a man who had been beaten and robbed who was lying on the side of the road. But a Samaritan helped him. Jesus told us to go and show mercy to all who are in need the same way the Samaritan did. As we have opportunity, we are to love Christians and non-Christians alike by helping them with meals, clothes, health care, fixing their cars, doing yard work, painting houses, giving them rides, etc. Fourth, we love by contextualizing. Paul says, I have become all things to all people, that by all means I might save some. 1 Corinthians 9.22 We never change the message of the gospel, 
but we can and should change non-essential aspects about external matters in order to remove obstacles from people giving us a fair hearing. We should not speak Christianese, but instead use language that is understandable to the people we are communicating with. We are to utilize the technology, art, clothing, and decor of the culture without sinning in order to remove obstacles from people hearing the gospel message and getting saved. The Missional Christ But what hinders us from living missionally? We do not grow in this by having someone else hype us up like William Wallace in the movie Braveheart. That would last about a week. What stops us from living missionally is that we have idolatrous desires. There are things that we want, usually good things in and of themselves, that have become ultimate things in our lives. That is what an idol is, something other than God that we are attributing ultimate worth to in our hearts. It is what we are centering our lives around. It is what drives us. It is what makes us happy and what we look to for satisfaction. It is what we crave, what we think we need at the deepest core of our being. What are some common desires that we have, some common idols that we struggle not to worship that stop us from living missionally? The idol of time. The desire to control our time for what we want. TV shows, movies, sports, shopping, reading, etc. If we live missionally, we will not have as much free time. The idol of money. Maybe we desire to maximize money so we can buy a new boat, a better house, a nicer car, or better clothes. If we live missionally, we will not have as much money to spend on ourselves. The idol of comfort. We have a desire to not be put in awkward situations. If we live missionally, that will definitely happen. Will I know what to say or how to say it? Or will I have to sacrifice the comforts of nicer amenities in my living situation? The idol of approval. We have a desire to be liked by others. If we live missionally, we know we will be rejected by many. We could go on and on. What is the most prevalent idol you struggle not to worship that stops you from living missionally? Thankfully, Jesus Christ had no idols. And he was full of love for his people. And that drove him to be a missionary. His love drove him to come after you, Christian. John Stott says, The sense of having been sent was a fundamental awareness of Jesus. It gave significance, urgency, and compulsion to everything he did. His mission dominated his mind and actions. Indeed, the phenomenon of Jesus is inexplicable otherwise. Wherever we look in his earthly career, his birth and boyhood, his words and works, his suffering and death, we are faced with the fact that he had been sent and that he knew it. Jesus did not only live as a missionary to give us an example that we now have to buck up and follow. He was living as a missionary to save us from our lack of caring about people who do not know God. We needed Jesus to come after us because we would have rightfully gone to hell for our sin, including our lack of concern for the lost. Remember the movie Saving Private Ryan? It is World War II. Private Ryan's three other brothers have all died. He is the only one left. So a rescue mission is planned for him. The sole mission of these other soldiers is to find Private Ryan and bring him safely home. Christ did this for you, Christian. He made it his mission to rescue you. But what Christ did is even more shocking than saving Private Ryan. First, Jesus did not go on his mission while grumbling and out of mere duty like the soldiers in the movie. He was excited to do it. He did it out of love and joy. Think about that. Second, we were not in the same army as Jesus fighting the same enemy. We were actually in the enemy army. We were fighting against God and Jesus in his missionary love came after us. It is safe to say that we are not and still are not the easiest people to love. But Jesus loved us by associating with us sinners. Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous but sinners to repentance. Luke 5, 31-32 Third, Jesus loved us with his words of grace, telling us truth and good news like in John 14, 2-3. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so... Would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, 
that where I am, you may be also. Fourth, Jesus loves us with good deeds, like giving his life as a ransom, Mark 10, 45, and upholding the universe and your breath and heartbeat by the word of his power, Hebrews 1, 3. He is the one directing your immune system, causing food to grow, allowing you to work your job, etc. Fifth, Jesus loved us by contextualizing. He spoke the normal language of his culture, lived a normal cultural life, and gave us the principles in his word that led to you being able to have a Bible in your own language. Lord's Supper Meditation The Lord's Supper reminds us of Christ's greatest deed, sacrificing himself on the cross to rescue us by his broken body and shed blood. His final goal as a missionary was to bring you to eternal joy in the presence of God. When we see and savor Jesus and his missionary love for us, our idols will be smashed, and with right motives and goals we will joyfully go out in missional love to others. We will go out relaxed and at peace, knowing that we will say and do the wrong thing time and time again, but also that Christ is the ultimate missionary who can use our far from perfect witnessing to save others. So, Christians, enjoy your missionary Christ as you feast on him at the table and go out into the culture to be the missionaries that you are by virtue of your union with him.